Who is it? Hey, it's me, Rish. It, it's big. Are you ready to, to record? Record? Yeah. You, you mean the Dune Steve? Yeah, yeah. It's 2014. It's a new year. I'm excited for once, and I, I really want to... Hey, hey, get... hey. I'm not excited. I'm, I'm, I'm burned out. Nobody cares about the show, least of all me. Oh... Uh... Yes? Do you want to do a podcast? Do you want to do a show? We could produce them really fast with a great big full cast and watch the money flow. No, no, no that might have worked years ago, but it's, it's way too much work. We don't get any recognition for the work that we do. It just, it's not worth it anymore, man. Sorry. Yes. Do you want to do a podcast? Are you feeling very bored? We could read stories all the time. Unless this line don't rhyme, we'll win Parsec Awards. Parsec Awards are rigged. Unless you're the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences, you don't even get a nomination. Or you actually win one when you don't bother to show up at the event or write an acceptance speech, and then they end up Okay, I got nothing. It's it's not worth the, 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 the aggravation. Leave me alone. Please. That better not be you, Big. Do you want to do a podcast? It could open many doors. And by the time it ends, we'll make loads of friends. Not to mention all the whores. F*** off! Okay, bye. I can't believe all these years later he's excited about that. I carried him for... S Wait, whores. I like whores. Friends, too. I, I've read about those. Huh. What? Yes, I want to do a podcast. You've convinced me with your song. I'm feeling optimistic now. Your singing showed me how. We haven't doon steefed in too long. Well, that's nice of you to finally come back and, and agree. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, you're too late, man. I, I started a new podcast with Marshall Latham, and I'm not interested anymore. But thanks. Oh. Okay. Really? It's time for another insufferable episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode. I was going to try and put in some sort of superlative, but it just doesn't fit. That's what another she said. Another episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. We'll just go with that. Okay. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And it's a new year, and we're raring to go. We're trying hard to do better this year than we did last year. Which, when it comes down to it, would not take a whole lot. <laughs> but we're not going to say that. We're just going to... Oh, wait, I did. Dang it. Uh-huh. Uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, we're raring to go. And we're going to record a show. What? What was that? <laughs> no singing, please. Oh, sorry. I forgot. You know, we had to bring an announcer man to karaoke night some, some year when we go to New Media Expo. That would be fun, huh? No. Oh. Can you imagine an announcer man up there singing in between puffs on his pipe? Don't all your friends smoke pipes? No, actually, I think you're the only one. The only one I've ever known in my life, really, that smokes a pipe. Although apparently, Except for crack pipes. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I've got a few of those upstairs, but that's different. What? Oh, um, yeah, that brought the house down. <laughs> uh, this is kind of exciting. This is the first of our triple word score winning stories. In this year, 2014, we're going to bring you a bunch of these contest winners. Fifteen. To be exact. That's more shows than we did all of last year. 
That's true. We're going to really have to be on the ball. I don't know. That seems like a lot to promise. Maybe we should edit that out. Well, editing's hard. Let's work. We're going to we're going to just leave it. They may not all be this year. We'll just take that. Pro- there will be 15 stories in total of triple word score. There isn't even 15 months in a year, so we probably won't get all 15 this year. But no, but this is a leap month. If there were 15 months in the year, you would get all 15 this year. No, they wouldn't. Shh. OK, this so is optimistic time. Briefly explain what the triple word score contest was. And then we will we'll just end the show without doing it. The, that will be the end. Okay. Uh, everyone signed up for the, sh- the contest and they were given three random words. We actually pulled them out of a hat. I have a picture of the hat with all the words in it to prove it. I've never shown it to anyone. Okay. Least of all you. But I do have the picture of the hat and, and the words were in there. People just suggested all sorts of words. Some of them were harder, probably, to include in a story than others, but I guess made it more of a challenge. What, wait, what do you think was the hardest word that anybody got? Doppelganger. Oh, hell no, Big Anklevich. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Some of them were really weird, and some of them were not so weird, so it's, it's hard to say. But hey, that contest was really successful, I thought. A bunch of people entered it, and a bunch of really good stories came out in one poem. And <laughs> and because they're so short, hopefully we will be able to get out a bunch and then do another contest. You'd like that, right? Sure would. Would yeah. you like that announcer, Matt? No, Rish Outfield. Okay. I guess the uh, jury has spoken. spoken. Returned their jury word. of our peers? Runaway jury. Oh, yes. John Grisham. Okay. Good. Glad that you brought John Grisham into it. So there were three words given to you at random, and you had to incorporate these three words into the story. Extra points if the words were really incorporated into the story and not just thrown in there as throwaway lines. Is that true? I didn't remember we were giving it. Well, that was supposed to be the deal. We probably just read the story and said, this is a good story, I give it an eight. Well, if it was you, this is a good story, I'll give it a three. Because... <laughs> For some reason, your bell curve is really off. (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, not quite a normal-sized shaped bell. That's what she said. Hey, good one, announcer. Wait. Is it? No, that one wasn't so good, announcer man. That's what she said. All right, a little better. Yeah, it's closer to the mark, at least Um, for Okay, so... Yeah, today's story is Tainted Angels by Jennifer Gifford. Oh, wait, wait, don't we have a Tainted Angels song, too? That's the uh, Cheryl Crow song you're confusing it with. Oh, tainted angels. Oh, I like it. Actually, I think that's a different song. I don't know. I thought the all singing episode was last week. Ha ha, joke's on you. We didn't have an episode last week. <laughs> Announcer man, how you like me now? <laughs> yeah, I'll get it done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So Jennifer Gifford's three words for her story were quiver, winter, and vampire. Huh. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Were we going to do the story? I expended all my energy on the song. Okay. Well, you just lay there then for a while, and uh, we'll let announcer man do your part. About the author. A uh, good one. Jennifer Gifford has always had a fascination with the dark and humorous side of fiction. She hates creepy old dolls, spiders, and garden gnomes. The inspiration for her story strikes her in the oddest of places, from an elevator, walking in class, even in the shower. Previously published in Dance Macabre, MysteryAuthors.com, and M Brain's Science Fiction Magazine, Her recent work can also be found at ATA Press. In turn, her nightmares are often the basis for her husband's stories, because she fears that writing her own nightmares will make them come true. Jennifer has been writing for almost two decades. She is currently senior editor at Bet Noir magazine and an assistant editor at Dark Opus Press.
All right. And uh, also, today's story was produced by Brian Lincoln, producer extraordinaire, <laughs> who always puts forth a wonderful product. Despite today's episode. <laughs> so enjoy the story. I think you shall. Tainted Angels by Jennifer Gifford Her house sinks down to death, and her course leads to the shades. All who go to her cannot return, and find again the paths of life. Proverbs 2.18-2.19 Evil always has a purpose. It's not random, not accidental and coincidence is never a factor. Evil is methodical, diabolical, and most of all, determined. Yet it's necessary for the balance of life. A world, a human world, cannot exist without both good and evil. There must always be a presence of the two for life to continue. For me, it's not about maintaining that balance of the two in the cycle of life. For me, It's about finding the small, intricate patterns that evil leaves behind, veiled as innocence and tinged with shadow. There is where my purpose lies. Everything about life and death has a function, and my purpose lies where evil breeds. My purpose is to kill her and her kind. Her scent brought me to this strange new city and I needed a new name. I never went by my real name. Few know it, and I haven't spoken it aloud in nearly a century. Names hold power, and in the wrong hands, something as simple as a person's name can bring about their undoing. I took my new name from a weathered tombstone in a cemetery that time and civilization had forgot. Brushing away the dusting of snow, I ran my fingers over the epitaph. I let his name roll off my tongue and over my dry lips, breaking the long-held silence of the cemetery's gated repose. Hollis. Hollis Van Kirk. Who had he been? What secrets did he long to tell the world that now lay unspoken in the hallowed grave in the Kirkyard? Kirkyard. I miss calling it that. It held so much more meaning resonating a sense of peace more so than the modern version of Graveyard, made popular by Victorian authors and their fear of dead bodies. Nothing in the ground of a kirkyard can harm. The bodies are blessed before going into the ground, and the ground itself is blessed before the first grave is dug. Silly superstitions and myths, which create romantic notions that hold no candle to the truth. There are older and far scarier things that walk about in broad daylight than lurk in a cemetery. Hollis Van Kirk. I said it again, trying to make it familiar. It was an old name, and it would have to do. The scent of the Holder Folk, those cursed offspring of the Lord's first created union, was stronger here. The stench, smelling of rotted flesh and smoke, burned the back of my throat and stung my eyes. The trail hadn't been this strong in months. Invisible to nearly all humans, they are the forgotten, unwanted souls doomed to share the fate of their mother. My heart ached only briefly for them. The lost ones that God abandoned and cast out, destined to become the soulless, depraved creatures of the night, they wandered doing their mistress's bidding. Pawns in a game that has gone on longer than time has spanned because of her, Lilith. I dared not speak her name, not with so many of her kind nearby. I didn't have much time, and I didn't want to linger. Her scent echoed in my memory, and I knew I was getting close. My brothers failed. I couldn't. I was the only one left. I was alone, and I was outnumbered. Our methods, our legacies, and much of the old ways have been lost. So much of history's truths are lost to mist and shadow. Who I am, and what I hunt, is nothing more than fiction and fairy tales to the humans of today. 
Our origins and rightful identities have been forgotten about over time, and we are nothing more than fodder for entertainment's sake. Lilith. The demon mistress whose sole desire was to breed an army of demons for the destruction of mankind. And me, Sansenery, the last of the chosen angels commanded by God, entrusted with only one mission. Destroy Lilith and her offspring. For eons, my brothers and I made our way in the world, hunting down the Holdra folk wherever we found them, killing them without question and mercy. They are pitiful, pale creatures with blackened eyes and stringy hair. Diabolical and cunning, their fair features and slight stature often allow them to pass as children. Modern legends call them black-eyed kids. They are devious in their methodology, feigning helplessness by knocking on a car window looking for their mother, or knocking on doors to use the phone because they are lost. It strikes sympathy into the hearts of humans. It's their hypnotic stare that lures their victims, willing them entrance. Always in pairs of two. They are sweet and gentle at first, until they are refused permission to cross a threshold. If refused, they become agitated and feral, screaming and hissing like the true habui, like the true vampires that they are. Now it was just me, the last of the seraphim angels, sitting in an overrun cemetery that hasn't seen a fresh grave in a half century. I longed to grieve for my brothers, Senery and Samangalov, but there was no time. I had my mission, and I'd sworn my allegiance to God. The stench of the Holderful grew stronger as I left the cemetery, and I suspected that they were seeking to rest before the brunt of the chilly weather set upon them. They gathered around their queen like bees in a hive, and while they didn't hibernate, they didn't fare well in the cold. It slowed their senses and responses. Of all the seasons, I love hunting in winter best, though I'm ashamed to admit it. That I find beauty in the aftermath of their slaughter, watching their blood pool on the fresh snow, causes me great discomfort in that all these long centuries of hunting evil Perhaps I have become evil myself. I shook my head of these thoughts and refocused on the mission at hand, restringing my bow and counting my arrows. My arrows are not tipped with gold and lead, as Cupid's mythology often states. Cupid. I'm embarrassed to admit that my name, my legacy, and the importance of our godly task has been muddled and remade into the tale of Cupid, shooting love-struck humans with arrows of love. They are simple pieces of wood, made from a thick branch from the tree of knowledge, given to me by Christ himself, and they flame with the power of the Almighty. They are indestructible, and always find their way back into my quiver, where I can easily reload my bow when needed. Walking a few blocks, I came to a row of stone cottages when the scent of Holterfolk overwhelmed me. In the distance, standing in the lighted doorway of a crofter's cottage, I spotted the pair. Please, miss. We thought we were taking a shortcut through the field over there, and now we're lost. Can we come in so we can call our mom? The elderly woman, probably a grandmother with grandchildren around their age, wasn't going to hesitate until I spoke. <clears throat> there you are. I let my voice hang in the night. The two snapped their heads around, black, fathomless pools of obsidian staring at me while their nostrils flared. I've been looking everywhere for you. Come on now, boys, let's get you back home to your mother. I waited by the gated courtyard, leaning against the stone facade. Waving to the elderly woman, I smiled. She didn't question the notion of two children appearing at her door at night nor did she question a handsome stranger coming to collect them. Humans see what they want to see. As I've said before, much about history is lost, and what remains is far from the truth. Who would believe that Cupid is truly an angel, on a mission from God, hunting down vampires like demonic vermin? My hand gripped my bow as I watched the two scatter on in front of me. Their maniacal laughter sent chills through me. I tracked their swift movements to an old cave, their laughter still echoing in the cavernous gloom. 
I was nervous, fearful of meeting the same fate as my brothers. Faith grows best in the winter of trial. It was Sennery's favorite piece of scripture from the book of James, and it echoed in my mind at just the right moment. I stood my ground, waiting for more of them to appear before unleashing a volley of arrows. I never missed my mark, and my arrows never failed to hit their targets. All right, everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed today's story, Angled Taint. And now uh, we've oh, got hey, a... Hey, I'm sorry. You said the name of the story wrong. It's actually... What? Embarrassing what you said there. Uh, the story is called Angel's Taint. Oh, shoot. You're right. It was an angel in the story. I'm sorry. I've totally... And today, or, or for all of these, in fact, we've asked a series of questions for the author to answer in lieu of an author's note. Right? That's right. So you came up with these questions for the authors, right? Would you like to read the questions for them and I will play the part of the author and answer it? Yes! But I will actually read the answers they sent. I'm not just going to make it up and play in the part. I'm going to... Oh. Anyways. Oh, that's not as funny as I thought it was going <laughs> to be. Okay, so uh, question number one. Was this a fun contest for you? And Jennifer said? This was a huge challenge for me to not have complete control over my story. Yes, it was three words, but those three words had so much impact over my story. I loved the concept and the challenge of writing it. Is writing generally fun to do anyway? I live to write. I'm a storyteller. It's in my blood. I write daily, and when I'm not writing, I'm thinking about writing in some form. See, now you're making me feel like I haven't pulled my weight, Jennifer. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, how did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? I loved the challenge of using three random words chosen by strangers. Well, yes, you were given three words at random. Uh, how much impact did the three words have on the finished product? I admit that I was panicked when I got quiver. <phone rings> Vampire and winter seemed easy enough to pull off, but quiver? I definitely had a W-T-H moment. None of that talk now. Shh. You're not invited, announcer man. But the muse bit me, and I think I developed a pretty good story. And I'm excited to hear the team at Doonstief produce it. Sure you didn't just say Dunstief, Jennifer? <laughs> yes, she did. How did you decide in what way to use the words? I'm a huge Hitchcock fan, so I like psychologically creepy tales. But I'm a sucker for gothic and Victorian prose, so I combined the two. The idea for the story struck me at my local writer's meeting that I co-chair, when a member started talking about misconceptions of people's character. I started thinking about fairy tales and fables, and the rest unfolded from there. Great. Last question. Who's your favorite doctor? Dr. Jekyll. I've never seen an episode of Doctor Who. I have no idea what a TARDIS is. How dare you. But a lot of friends recommend the show. So thank you, Jennifer, for, for answering all those questions. I thought there were only three, but there ended up being like 11. Well, I think three, you, you made them three, but they were like one of those where there's f several questions in one kind of a right. thing. I, so. didn't, I just didn't want somebody to say yes and then move on to the next right. question. Brian Lincoln produced this. And is it fair to say that Brian Lincoln has now eclipsed me as producer of the most stories next to you? Probably. I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. He's done an awful lot of stories for the show over the years, and we're going to make him do every single one of these triple word scores. So, And I think that that's awesome. <laughs> um, I found out just last week, Brian Lincoln is a doctor. You didn't know that? He's my favorite doctor. Ah, that's nice. <laughs> uh, the, the way I found out is um, I walked in and he was examining a young woman. But Trust me, I'm a doctor of physics. But <laughs> he's so smart and he's so dedicated to doing the audio or whatever that I, I, I always feel bad giving him our little episodes. But I'm not going to stop. <laughs> so thank you, Brian, for, for doing that. And uh, did we have a cast list? Is, is there, who, who did the many, many voices? The many, many voices were done by Brian Lincoln. 
Brian Lincoln was narrator extraordinaire and producer Producer extraordinaire. I believe your niece was the the voice of the children, the evil children. Oh, Oh, hey. Okay. And so thank you, Brian, for doing all that. And thank you, Jennifer, for submitting the story to the contest. And again, I'll probably say this many, many, many times, and this is the first. Thank you to all the people that read the stories and rated them and that gave us their love. So let's talk about angels and and taints. <laughs> Two of my uh, favorite subjects. Okay. Off the subject of taints and angels. Okay. I, I suppose this is probably something that may come up a lot in these stories, but how small our cast list was. It was one person and then one line for another person. I guess that's what you get when you have short stories. We we that was one thing we never mentioned was we put a limit, a word limit on our stories this time. Because we knew we would probably get a lot of entries and we didn't want this contest to be such a chore that we were just, you know, when it was done, we were going to go, oh, screw this. Never again another con. Never. So we put a 2,000 word limit on the the stories. I believe so. Well, because from our Broken Mirror story two years ago now, just Secret Santa and The Calling Equaled probably every single one of these stories put together. <laughs> True enough. And there were something like 45 people, I think, that put their hat in the ring in the, to begin with. Wow. So we got to put a, a stop to that in the new year. There was, <laughs> there was a lot to read. Uh, so it was really nice to get all the help that we did. I hope people enjoyed the, the experience. I did. And there was, a, you know, I was really surprised. I remember when I first started reading them just how many good stories there were no wonder we're doing 15 of them because there was just too many to say oh you know we the cutoff is here there was lots and lots of really good stories and then brian lincoln's he'll get his he will and you've got a point there but isn't it possible that these that this was too short that's what she said What? what i don't get it you should get it it's been said to you many times by a she-male. I mean, the female, sorry. <clears throat> hey, that ain't funny, man. <laughs> I, I have to agree with the announcer man in this case. <laughs> no, uh, the story was just enough to get me interested, to get me in the door, and then it ended. I think you could make this one much longer. I, mean, I guess I say that on every story, don't I? You do say that an awful lot. That is true, especially on a shorter story. I mean, shorter stories are kind of that way. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it when we finally get around to my own story, but I had a hard time doing this contest and writing a short story, and I I had to cut a scene out to make it fit in under the word count. I had three scenes. I cut one of my three scenes out to make it fit. So it's really difficult to get in under the word limit, and I think a lot of the stories that we got, while they were really good, would have been twice as good if they were twice as long. And they were able to really expand it. We had, with this story, a really good taste of this world. There's something really interesting going on here. I mean, then then we have to end. We don't even get to see him put an arrow through those children's eyes. Whoa, what? Like he should have. No, no, no. We're talking about Cupid again. We're not talking about what Brian Lincoln does in his spirit. (laughs) You've got You're totally right there. Um, The Cupid aspect... Is a story all in its own, you know, just, uh, what she said in her author's note about the misconceptions of maybe what Cupid started out as and what he's now considered to be, which is just like another logo for selling chocolates or whatever on every <laughs> February. That was really interesting. And the whole, I, mean, I know it's been done to death in modern literature, but the whole like Children of Lilith thing, that's something I'm not familiar with. I never heard of Lilith until... Sarah McLaughlin started faring about her. You know, it just, I, I really, I think, I always think of Fraser Crane's wife on Cheers when somebody says Lilith. So to me, it's just like, wow, what, a, oh, I want to hear more. I want to know more. Maybe everybody that wrote a very short story and had to hack and slash it to get it even shorter for our contest can put out like their full versions of that, you know, and, and, and expand on it and sell them in some other arena. I would like to see your, Tainted Angel. No. Whoa, 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 whoa. I would like to see your full That's what she said. Announcer man, stop it, please. (laughs) 
I, I, I invited it. him over because I was like, I felt bad we didn't really include Announcer Man in the last episode. And now he just won't shut up. Uh, oh, I, I would like to see your story with all the edited out parts put back in. Maybe, you know, if you'd sell it on, on Amazon or Smashwords or whatever and people could go to that, that would be cool. But we're not talking about your story. No, we'll talk about my story when my story comes around, Did I think. Did we do but... our listeners a disservice by putting a cap on how long the stories should be? If if we did this contest again, would it been, have been better to have fewer entries but longer stories? Yeah, you know, I think we actually discussed that. I mean, sorry, we discussed that. After the story was, or after the contest ended, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Maybe what we needed to do instead of putting a cap on the words was put a cap on the amount of people that could participate and say, first 20 people that send us an email saying, I want to participate, can participate. Well, that's how we'll do the next one. And that way we could let them write longer stories. We still got to put a cap on the length, though. Right? Sort of, yeah, but... I think most people, especially when it's a contest story, nobody's going to write a 20,000-word story like you might do if given five years to put the story together. So I don't know if we really need to put a cap on it. You know, you give somebody a small period of time to write it in, and that just kind of caps the limit all on its own. You say you have a month to write it. Somebody can't do something too sprawling and over the top in that period of time. Okay. And if they do, then you can just give them a bad score for it. Just say, oh, sorry, this was too long. You get a three. Take that. Okay, that's that's what I would do. You would be like, hey, this story was just right. You get a three. <laughs> uh, wait, I already told that joke today. Or was it a joke? <laughs> the thing about this story that I responded to, and you can predict what it is if you've ever listened to the Dune Steve, the idea of children... That aren't really children. There's something else masquerading as children. Oh, I love that idea. As you really? Well, as you darn well know. But again, I could I could see a lot more stuff going on. I would really like to see a lot more stuff going on with this. So so I love the children aspect. The the pseudo children. Evil. Don't touch it. It's evil. <laughs> Wasn't it you who introduced that phrase to me? Probably. But the other thing that I really dug was the idea <laughs> that he had these blast. I almost said magic, but they're like holy arrows that he would fire into one of these beings and destroy it. And the arrow would find its way back into his quiver. That is so cool. I mean, it, it reminds me of Thor's hammer coming back to him after he throws it or Captain America's shield coming back to him after he throws it or, or spider-man's jewish guilt coming back to him <laughs> and I, after I just, he throws up i i love that kind of stuff too it was just a little detail but it made the story way better for me the arrow cut from the tree of life <laughs> we talked about you you mentioned how she said you know the misconceptions of of fairy tales and stuff and just the idea of taking cupid and making cupid a badass <laughs> You know, Cupid is generally like a, a cherubim looking little baby just wearing like a diaper or not even that, just a naked butt baby <laughs> with little bitty stupid wings like that couldn't make something fly, especially not a big fat baby like Cupid is always drawn to be. And, you know, he's got his little arrow and he's always like hee, 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 doing the little pose that's like really wussy looking instead of, you know, this guy who's just like. I, I see like Hugh Jackman or somebody playing this guy like you. What was that movie? Van Helsing. Yeah. Like when he was Van Helsing or whatever. You could even I mean, I, I, I would hate to do this to Jennifer Gifford because she doesn't deserve it. But even somebody like Vin Diesel playing <laughs> playing this Cupid guy. Oh, oh, uh, I The would Rock. Pay, I would pay to see The Rock or no, but The Rock was the Rock was the Cupid, yeah. Oh, that was the Tooth Fairy, you're right. But yeah, to see Vin Diesel like in a diaper and with these little <laughs> undersized wings. He's like, I wish I had the camera. I think that would be really cool. But yeah, I wouldn't want to see him in a diaper. But I, I you know, I'd see him as basically looking like Neo or, or Morpheus, all, you know, wearing the black leather and the long trench coat and all that stuff. But then he has these little kind of smallish white wings sticking out and he's got this nasty looking bow instead of you know the cheesy little one 
it just seems like a really interesting and cool idea of Cupid as being a tough guy. Do you remember, and this doesn't really apply when it comes down to it, but there was a TV show maybe 10 years ago or less called Cupid, and it was about a guy. There was the doubt in there. He thought he was Cupid, and he was seeing this woman that was the shrink, and there was always the the sexual tension between this guy and his shrink. And the shrink was trying to help him understand he's not Cupid. But every episode he would go out and like help somebody fall in love or something like that. I think it only made it one season or half a season or a quarter of a season or however long they let shows. that Alicia Silverstone in that? Jeremy Piven was Cupid. I remember him being good as the role of Cupid though. Okay. I saw. I actually saw this show. Uh, so apparently, no, it was not Alicia Silverstone, uh, <laughs> and it was a little longer ago than I was remembering. This is from all the way back in 1998. Is this really what you guys want to be talking about tonight? The, it seems like the words that she got weren't too bad. Like she said, she was afraid to try and figure out how to use quiver, which I think worked out well for her because then she's just like quiver arrows, Cupid. Cupid. And it made for a really interesting thing to me. But quiver could just mean, like, shaking. That's true. Or like what the women's loins do when they're near you. (laughs) Okay. I think Rish is right. We weren't going to go there, but sure. Wow, today's show sucks more than a $2 hooker at a software convention. Oh, okay. Thanks again for keeping us grounded. So, yeah... So, yeah, there's a lot of elements about the story that really interest me. And I think the three words, it seems like some of the words were really hard to put a story together and then others not so much. And you look at her three words and you have vampire, quiver and winter. And those all three seem like they can lend themselves to a pretty good story. Yeah, maybe somebody cheated for her the way I cheated for you. Great. Algar Van Kluth got butt plug, a pencil sharpener, and Avril Lavigne. So. Oh my gosh! Are you kidding? Me? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, some of them I think were harder than others, and uh, people still managed to work them in. We had like forty-five people put their hat into the ring, but I don't think we got that many stories. I think some people got their words and just said, "Oh, f this! I give up because there's no way I'm making a story out of that." Which I can also understand. Because sometimes it's hard, but I've really enjoyed, you know, she talked about how much she enjoyed the idea or the constraints of having to take these words and use them and go with them. And I really like that too. Just, okay, here's, these are the things that are going to be part of my story and how can I make them part of a story and sitting there and letting your mind turn until you finally come up with something that works with all three of them. And that was one of those things that we kept saying, too, is each one of these are supposed to be important in your story, not just, hey, I threw them in. I don't remember us ever saying that. Well, maybe I was the only one that said that, but I tried to say, yeah, don't just shoehorn these in in some lame way, like say, antique dozer haunting. Those are three words that don't mean anything. And then you start your story and go into something completely different. Antique dozer haunting is a story in itself right there. <laughs> there you go. A haunted antique bulldozer. Yeah. Who, who got that one? Uh, I don't know. It's on the list here, but I've lost my place. Okay, no worries. But uh, that's that's the fun, I think, of this whole thing. And it's cool. We have 14 more of these to look forward to. Yeah. I, I And sometime around the middle of the Hillary Clinton administration, we will get to your story. Yeah, that should be about right. All right, so I think we've run down to the end of this episode, and we're going to go ahead and call it an evening. Thanks to Jennifer for her story. Thanks to Brian for producing it. And thanks to you for listening. Yeah, please donate to the show. Yep, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield, asking you again to please donate to the show. That's right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Please donate to the show. That's my line. Oh, sorry. But no, no, what he said. I just wanted to help you emphasize it. It can't be emphasized enough, apparently. Thank you, Scott Sigler. (laughs) 
Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Good night, everybody. Okay, bye. Take two. Do you want to build a snowman? Oh, it's recording over here. At least somebody out there, at least Wendy Cooper will appreciate this. You think? I don't think so, man. I think that's stretching it. (laughs) Think. (laughs) All right. Okay, you ready? Do you want to do... (laughs) Sorry, I'm smiling too much. (laughs) I can't sing when I'm smiling too much. It won't work. Parsec awards are rigged. Unless you're the Bureau of County Pig Affair. Let me find out their name. Michael Jackson impersonators of the Fudge and Brian Lincoln full cast podcast. Bureau of... How do you spell Bureau? (laughs) Uns... Unskinny bot. (laughs) I'm too sexy for my pants. <laughs> You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine with your hosts, Rich Outfield. Hi, too sexy for my pants. And I'm Big the, Anklevich. Too sexy for my cat. For pussy, for pussy cat. <clears throat> Whoops, that was supposed to close for real. That's what I said. Is it? Well. <clears throat> Maybe we should ask the robot to edit out your, your promise of 15 episodes. Uh, we haven't fixed the robot yet. We're going to have to oh. edit out the comment about the robot editing out a comment. Okay. Well, that's, that's <laughs> fine. Yeah. I, that's a, a I skit. It smelled good in here. That's a skit still to come, sir. <clears throat> oh. Jennifer Gifford is somebody, and I don't know anything about her. Let me see if we've... Oh, you broke it, you tainted angel. <laughs> uh, tainted angel. Let me see if we got anything from her on here. Jennifer Gifford. Don't we have her questions and all that crap? Oh, that's right. Jennifer Gifford, the taint angel taint. <laughs> Does it really say angel taint? <laughs> that's what. He angled taint, it actually <laughs> Angled taint. Which was sent out by, I suppose, you to Brian. That must be what that is, because this is to Brian. Oh. <laughs> angled taint. <laughs> he read a quote from the frickin' Bible. No changes to me in the story. We need to say that when we come back. All right, so that was our story for you today, angled taint. Uh, <clears throat> no, no, it was... Actually, Angel's Taint. <laughs> I've never seen an episode of Doctor Who. I have no idea what a TARDIS is, but a lot of friends recommend the show. Cool. I will never watch it, though, um, because you think it's cool. F you, Rish Outfield. That's what it says, word for word. I'm not, I, I didn't make any of that up. <laughs> okay, maybe a little bit. Uh, okay, I made up all of it. <laughs> Just so you know, uh, Big is a TARDIS. <laughs> there you go. And it was a little longer ago than I was remembering. This is from all the way back in 1998. There was this short period where I watched a lot of TV right around then. I th- I think the new uh, Fantasy Island series that had, what's that white-haired dude Malcolm on McDowell. it? Malcolm McDowell. Malcolm McDowell, yeah. Th- th- that one came out like that same year. What did they do for Tattoo? Uh, they just tattooed people. He was a little tattoo on your shoulder, and he went, nye, 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 nye. I have no idea. I don't remember anything about that new one except for that that guy was Mr. Rourke. Was it Rourke? Yeah. Okay. Smiles, everyone. Right. Smiles. He was Mr. Rourke, and he was more creepy than, like, happy. It was really? kind of, like, weird and creepy-ish, and maybe that's why it only lasted, like, six months, too. I kind of like to see that, though. 
I well, I bet the, you could find it on Netflix the, or something. I don't know how much we've talked about Fantasy Island, but there was this theory early, early on that Mr. Rourke, like the first season, some people, the fans of the show back in the 70s, uh-huh. started to speculate that Mr. Rourke was actually God and he had come on down to earth to like, you know, entertain himself and bring people happiness and all that stuff. And the writers picked up on that, that people were saying that. And so they started incorporating that into like the later seasons. There'd be like overt stuff that this guy was actually God. That eventually they bring Roddy McDowell in as Satan, as like, huh. you know, as the enemy of Mr. Rourke, and they did battle or whatever. And I remember was, that vividly as a child. Who was Tattoo? Was Tattoo it? was the still small voice. <laughs> See what I did still there? Say that. <laughs> Uh, okay, so do you want to do a podcast? Done with the Fantasy Island thing. What is a fantasy, Biggie? Algar Van Kluth got butt plug, a pencil sharpener, and Avril Lavigne. So. Oh my gosh! Are you kidding? Me? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that. <laughs> I get, stop laughing. So, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it's Van Kloof. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that's a fake one that you added in after, but. <clears throat> How many of those fake ones are there? <laughs> I don't know. I think that's the only one, but who knows? Why <laughs> That's such a, a <laughs> random thing. Afro uh, Levine is somebody not relevant in any way. <laughs> oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe we should save some of the discussion about your writing process for your story. Oh, well, we can just clip the those segments out and just put them wholesale right into that episode and save some time. What do you think? I think that stuff never works. People, <laughs> people probably won't even notice the difference. We keep saying the same damn thing over and over again anyways. We will. Yeah. <laughs> Each episode is going to sound like a rerun, along with the really bad Ricardo Montalban impression. <laughs> Speaking of rerun... Uh, I don't know if I told you this story, but this guy I know at work the other day, he said he was at Starbucks, and this guy came in, and he had a shirt on, and it had Rerun from What's Happening on it, doing all these dance moves. You know how Rerun was, like, famous for being a crazy dancer, so it's got, like, you know, several different pictures going across and down the shirt, like, maybe 12 pictures in all of Rerun and various dance moves, and the guy sees the shirt, and he's like, oh, and he goes and he talks he's like hey that's a really cool rerun shirt you got there and the guy looks at him with this weird look and he's like what the hell are you talking about so apparently this guy saw the shirt with rerun dancing on it bought it and had no idea at all who rerun is or why what's on the shirt so that has nothing to do with anything, but I thought that was just kind of a humorous story. Well, yeah, your wife bought your son a Punisher t-shirt, <laughs> not knowing that it was a Punisher t-shirt. It was, just had a skull on yeah, it. Yeah, she's like, oh, it's a t- t-shirt with a skull on it. And, um, yeah, I think I remember you did one of those little comic strips about it. Where it's like, what? Ultraviolent superhero? I thought it was just a t-shirt with a skull. Right, she'd gotten a, a poster of jessica rabbit or something and put it up on the wall and it's like jessica rabbit i thought it was just a big titted scantily was, cloud cartoon character it was just a chick with big jugs i didn't <laughs> uh anyways that could probably be cut out <clears throat> um yes. bum, 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 bum.